Today we're talking to Alex Pollack from Loftus Peak Global Disruption Fund. Alex, thank you. good morning. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. You know, we're back in our offices. This is very exciting. You know, this, I know. Is day, this is day two back in a real office instead of a home office. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so welcome. Uh, tell you. me what's been happening. Obviously, it's been three or four months of probably the most extreme dislocation disruption that's been going on globally. Uh, how's the Global Disruption Fund handled that? Um, we have done, you know, well, better than our peers actually by, you know, arguably quite a long way. So, it, uh, you know, we, we take no pleasure in COVID itself. It, it's been a tragedy and, and that is what it is. Um, but the companies in which we have invested have formed part of the solution to the COVID problem, meaning they are the companies that allow people to work from home, to shop from home, to go to the doctor from home, to be entertained at home. In other words, they're companies that enable, um, you know, distance, the, w the world to function, so to speak, at a safe social distance uh, by using, you know, today's modern tools like the cloud, like uh, distributed networks, like, you know, ubiquitous broadband, etc. So we certainly did not own these companies with the ex expectation of COVID, but we did own these companies, companies like Apple and Tencent and, and NVIDIA and, and Roku. We did own these companies because they um, are more efficient companies insofar as they do not require the transportation of people to and from places or or unnecessary transportation of goods um, and so are more efficient and therefore are more profitable and therefore have larger balance sheets and therefore are richer and therefore are able to deal with um, a period of you know economic up you know downturn longer than others so as I say we we didn't do this we didn't set up the COVID intentionally but uh, we've been, our companies are beneficiaries of, 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 by answering questions that COVID poses. So the whole concept of setting up a fund called the Global Disruption Fund, uh, because those companies were disrupting uh, business as we knew it, or the business world, the economic world as we knew it, uh, have actually benefited from the disruption of, of COVID. Well, they have. I mean, it's not to say they wouldn't have been higher without COVID, but they've done better relative to, for example, transport companies and hotel companies, all the companies that are absolutely, um, you know, in trouble because they, because people can't move about freely and go from city to city. So they've done better than those companies and in that sense have been relatively much better performers. Can you give an example of some of those and how they've performed and also whether you've changed the portfolio in any way as a result of COVID? Some of the companies that have performed, well, Apple has, well, a lot of people own Apple, no big deal. Apple has performed incredibly strongly. We are um, investors in Qualcomm for this 5G rollout for, for mobile telephony and it has performed quite strongly because mobile telephony and ubiquitous broadband again are part of the solution that, that, that enable business to run and people to operate without having to uh, you know physically move around and so you know Qualcomm has been a, be a beneficiary of that as well. Microsoft too. I think it was Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft, who said on the earnings call just uh, a month and a half ago, we had uh, two, uh, two years of digital development took place in Microsoft in the space of six weeks. You know, by by which he meant that the acceleration of people using Team Viewers, Zoom conference calls, um, uh, um, you know, doctors seeing patients remotely was going on at a level anyway, but they had a two, that they are now where they would have been two years further down the track in terms of the rollout of those businesses as a result of COVID. COVID is a forcing function. I think we've said this a couple of times before. It's a forcing function. In other words, people might already have wanted to shop from home or work from home. COVID 
forced them to have to do it. And, and, and that's called a forcing function. And the forcing of people to do this, um, ha, you know, accelerated the, the business of these companies like Microsoft, like, you know, uh, Amazon, like um, Alibaba, etc. in China. It forced them to do this and so it sped up there and gave them, you know, as it were, a couple of years growth just in a, in a matter of a few weeks. So one of the other things about the companies uh, in the fund is that they've got very strong balance sheets, um, a lot of cash, they're generating huge amounts of cash. On the other side of that, do you see the, a downside from those uh, companies and, and would you ever uh, look at, at changing your strategy at all to perhaps shorting uh, companies that are not the beneficiaries of disruption? Well, Chris, it's conceptually a sensible question. We're not set up for shorting yet, just because you know we're a long, we're a long only fund. Um, but but it's certainly the case. I mean, I guess a lot of people thought five years ago when we set up the fund, they had they had an Apple phone and they knew how Google Maps worked, and that was the end of disruption. Um, and in fact, five years down the track, there's a whole lot of things that have happened that continue to disrupt. Uh, and we have moved the portfolio towards those things as well. I'm talking in particular to this general move towards the cloud, the, this cloudification, which is the thing that enables you know a million people to Google search something and get an answer within a second or two. Um, so uh, this new disruption which we are playing right now is the move out of the date internal, you know. IT hub that companies have run, generally speaking, towards a, a, a public cloud. And the reason for that is previously, let's say if you were Woolworths, you know, you had to set up your system such that for the biggest day of the year, which was pre-Christmas, uh, you had to be able to, all your cash register had, had to work, your stock control had to work for that big day. But for the other 364 days of the year, your your capacity requirements were very, very much smaller. And so you will you wind up as Woolworths building a huge capacity information technology premises, you know, in your own in your own company that really is only operating at 20% capacity for the, for 90% of the time. So uh, companies kind of got wise to this as companies like AWS, Amazon and Microsoft set up cloud that you could buy where you could buy capacity on the day just for a minute or an hour or a week or whatever you liked. And so it, it variabilized the cost of this. It took the capital expenditure that would have been required by companies, turned it into, you know, as you need operating expenditure. And it's a big layer of costs out of these companies. So that's disruption that continues to roll on and is quite different from the way things might have looked 10 years ago. Alex, the, the companies that you've noted to date um, have been global companies, offshore companies, whether it be China or the US. Do you have any local Australian companies that come under your radar? Um, our mandate is global, Chris, and we, we have invested in Australian companies. I'm thinking particularly of groups like Atlassian, we, we, we're happy to invest in an Australian-based company as long as it's a global player. Atlassian certainly is that. And we've owned it in the past and I think we'll probably own it again over time. Um, but, but we always look for companies that are playing on a global stage because that gives us, you know, comfort that there's plenty of runway. And, and, and often we invest in companies that are, might be only 10 or $20 billion in valuation. And we want to see those companies be able to grow to 100 or 200 billion in valuation. NVIDIA is a very good example. When we first bought NVIDIA, I think it was capped at uh, 30 or $40 billion. Today, it's capped at over $220 billion. When we first bought Amazon, uh, it was capped at, uh, I think, it was $300 a share and now it's $2,500 a share uh, and virtually you know, valued over a trillion dollars. So we've always looked for companies that play on the global stage so that 
that are executing well because that gives us plenty of headroom to know that our stock prices can go well over time. Alex, with those sorts of numbers, do you think there's a risk that the market for those companies, the FANGs and, and your disruption type companies, is getting ahead of itself? Are they getting overpriced or are they just pricing in future earnings? Um, I think there's been a perception that, that um, you know, that the multiple, if you like, the PE multiple for these companies has expanded and that's not really what's going on. Uh, I mean, there's a bit of PE expansion going on as well, of course, there, there always is in these kinds of companies. But fundamentally, the companies have got more expensive because the earnings have grown commensurate and the PE might have expanded, you know, a turn, one of, you know, 10%, etc. But essentially, these companies have done well because they have generated significantly higher earnings over a five-year period, and that's why they're priced more fully uh, than they have been in the past. It's not an, not really multiple expansion. People don't, for example, appreciate when looking at Netflix that that. In another, you know, there'll be another debt issue in Netflix in a year or two's time of a couple of billion dollars. But on a three to five year basis, Netflix will be returning capital to uh, shareholders. This is not generally understood from looking at the numbers. We look at the P&L balance sheet and cash flow of these companies every day. Netflix, you know, is one of them, and we see that they are coming to the end of their requirement for debt and will be a, a net generator of cash flow, which can be, you know dividended out to uh, shareholders or as a return of capital. It's quite interesting talking to a manager who hasn't had to drastically rethink uh, strategy or the companies in the portfolio. Um, you know, we've seen obviously some severe dislocation in markets. Uh, it strikes me that you haven't had to rethink the port, I'm not saying you've ignored the portfolio, but you haven't had to rethink the portfolio or the premise for including companies in the portfolio. No, the the uh, portfolio is very much the post-COVID portfolio is identical virtually to the pre-COVID portfolio. I say virtually because I think we do drop things in and out as part of the normal way we look at companies and the way we invest, but fundamentally. The companies that we own, we've owned uh, for the past five or six years. The weights have varied pre and post COVID slightly, but you know fundamentally they're the same. We haven't had to change anything. The companies that we have invested in have very strong business models, um, and those strong business models, as I say, are kind of predicated on not you know, removing inefficiencies in the system. You know, you, you don't have to, to run a supermarket. You don't have to have uh, a space in a Westfield mall. Uh, Amazon is a classic example of this. But if you don't have space in a Westfield mall, that's an immediate 15% cost advantage you have because you're paying much lower rent. And then you can reinvest that cost saving in the form of lower prices to your customers or you you know, adding different services in the case of Amazon home delivery, adding in a television service, you know, adding in cloud services, etc. So, um, no, so we haven't had to change it. That's right. And and looking forward, therefore, to that. I mean, one would suspect there's still a long way to go in this uh, in this sort of post-COVID or current COVID environment. Um, whether it's travel, whether it's a second wave, uh, whether it's restrictions, whether it's trade difficulties. Um, do you see any sort of major dangers for your portfolio uh, looking down the track? As I said, it's difficult to look down the track with so many variables, but do you, do you foresee any issues there? Um, well, to be honest, not, not really. I mean, you always worry about some left field, you know, black swan event. Um, but the black swan event was COVID for us, and and we we sailed through that okay. Um, might there be other black swan events? Yes. I mean, the geopolitical situation with Trump and China and Russia is, you know, <laughs> interesting to say the least. So I, you know, we don't know how that would roll, and that could have a an impact on us in ways that we haven't even considered yet. But um, no, it's we, we can't. We don't have a lot of visibility about, you know, 
uh, black swan events coming up. Uh, we hope there aren't too many. <laughs> Alex, it's always fascinating talking to you and, and talking to someone who doesn't worry about the day-to-day -day generations of the market, looks at the longer term and the trends of what's going on, particularly with technology. Thank you so much for your time today and we look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks, Chris. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on.